I'm joined today by Richie. Richie is a, is a copper. Well, he's spent pretty much nearly 30 years in the copper in the in the police force, and, and still is. Got to inspector stage. Uh, a lot of the um, areas that um, Richie has been involved in is is transport, so road pursuit, and in particular interest to this podcast is aviation. So helicopter helicopter pursuit, and ended up running the aviation team and. He has so many absolutely brilliant stories to tell and, and ideas about how we find the very best in ourselves, how we deal with extremely stressful situations, how we build the resilience to to counter the, the criticism, which is clearly very, um, very prominent in the police force. So welcome, Richie. It's lovely to have you here. Hello. No, nice to be speaking to you. Thank mm-hmm. you. That's brilliant. So, Richard, just give us a little bit of a, a couple of minute bio of your of your background and how you got into the police and, and where you are now. So, so I joined uh, what was he, Hertfordshire Constabulary in 1993. So a wee while ago, uh, and I retired uh, in 2022, December 2022. In that nearly 30 years of police service, uh, two areas of work is by sometimes by luck, sometimes by design. Uh, and competence, I, hate, I, I have to add. Um, I got into certain roles and certain <laughs> ranks within those roles. And the two key roles, as uh, Ben's alluded to, were police aviation, so um, a, a small air support unit covering uh, sort of southeast and central England. Did that for 11 years uh, as a constable, a sergeant, and fine latterly as an a acting inspector. And then also roads policing. And both roles are intertwined to some degree. So roads policing, again, is a, a constable. Uh, a sergeant, and I retired as a roads policing operational inspector back in 2022. So there were other roles that I did in the police service, which would have been uh, would have fed, fed into those two key roles uh, from firearms commanders, control room inspectors, uh, the dungeon master, custody sergeant, and patrol function. So, yeah, lots of bits and pieces in the police service, but those were my two primary sort of roles within, the, within my 30 years. That's fascinating. So the, the, the obvious links to, well, in both aviation, although you, you were an observer in the helicopters and looking after the department and in charge of the team generally is that when things go wrong, it's, in, it's completely catastrophic, of course, to, to life, really. And I, it, and it's one of those things that we don't, we don't go to work every day thinking life is going to be lost. We go thinking, how do we improve our performance? How do we get the very best? Out of the day, so it, it even though it captures our attention, doesn't it? The whole, the whole drama of it, it is, I suppose, the excitement of it. It's actually very applicable to to everyday life, really. And I, I think you've you've shared with me lots of ideas about how how you've built these teams around each other. I mean, you do, clearly do a lot of personal development as well, really. So how, how do you how, so putting that team together in the helicopter? How did you? How would you recruit? the people that you thought were appropriate? How would you build the relationship with the pilots knowing that to work as a team is incredibly important because the outcome could be catastrophic, obviously? Well, it's interesting. My, my, my team that I applied for in back in 2000 uh, was the Chilton Air Support Unit. So a two aircraft, two base unit that was fortunate to have the right people. And sometimes that's the case in, it, in, a, in a team or a department or an organisation. You just have the right people. Uh, the, the pilots in those days, and so much now with National Police Air Service, and uh, we invariably ex-military background. We had a more of an ex-Navy uh, team of pilots. But what was interesting, we had um, one of the police officers acting as an air observer was a pilot himself. Um, and uh, I think I can use the phrase, he got it. He got it as far as crew resource management is concerned and that relationship you have with a team of people that have different roles, different responsibilities, different backgrounds, understandings and experiences, and sometimes different priorities within a team. Uh, uh, but ultimately, while working as a whole, uh, for one priority, which is in the police aviation world, a safe deployment of an aircraft. So you know, I, one takeoff equals one landing, uh, uh, and you use a tank full of fuel uh, in between, uh, doing what you have to do. And what I found interesting, now I had failed to try to become a fast jet pilot in the Royal Air Force back at Biggin Hill back in the day, for those old enough to remember air crew selection back at Biggin Hill. We spent four or five days down there being um, looked at intently by um, guys and girls uh, as, as an 18, 19 or 18 year old then I was. Um, but some of the elements of what we did for re- uh, recruiting into police aviation to our unit was quite unique in the UK, was based not on how good you can write, 
how good you could speak, i.e. a written application and interview, but the bit in between, how, what skills have you got to give uh, to the unit to be trained and us and the, and the trainers and the bosses be confident that you will pass the course, which in my unit, we were, so we were unique, unique uh, in a selection process in so much that um, we had a day of, so people, oh, oh people applied. We normally have about 30 applications for one post. We'd invite everyone to um, at the base uh, and they sit a day of exams. And the exams would be, you most of them, you wouldn't be able to achieve 100% because the, the time constraints imposed on the exam. That wasn't the idea. The idea was to put a bit of pressure, time pressure, because it's important in police aviation and in policing in general. Put a bit of time, a collapsing time frame, a frame, a word, a phrase that is used quite a lot in the police service. And um, uh, people would walk out lunchtime going, oh, I've not achieved what I need to achieve in this exam. Thanks very much for giving the opportunity. Uh, I'll leave it there. And out of that, you'd pick the two or three uh, highest scorers in that written set. And the test would be based on priority assessments. So you get a, 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 it's almost a, a paper feed of scenario. What would you do when, if, do this to map, map understanding, map understanding of ordnance survey maps. Uh, understanding of uh, looking at photographs and where are they on the map, because that's almost what you're seeing from the aircraft sort of thing, etc. Uh, and then the successful three, four candidates would go then to a flight test. They sit in the, the command seat in an aircraft, they give an hour and a half of fuel and some scenarios, navigation scenarios, an active mock made up vehicle follow, not pursuit, but so it's that, just a follow to see how they could give a commentary, how they could command the individuals. We're not expecting a polished subject, someone who'd come out that would be the best for the role, but uh, ultimately someone who's got the right um, the right stuff about them to do the job. And then the interview later would be almost uh, just sort of a fact-finding mission. Uh, and to try, also, if you've got two or three applicants have got to that stage, find the best person for the job out of the two or three. I'll put them in a pecking order to, for the next recruitment process. And we've got the right people. So people, we had 100%. So I joined in 2001, did, did that process, uh, was successful, did the, uh, the initial course, uh, passed with colleagues, uh, and came on, you know, over the years to be the sergeant inspector on the unit as well. So flying, um, you know, ready with the crew. Then we looked at other, we looked at other air support units, and a lot of them used the old-fashioned paper application and interview process, and they found that they were losing um, applicants through uh, the training course. So they're paying a lot of money for a course because you're doing a bit of flying in the course uh, and you're paying in trainers that are qualified uh, and they, they, they were hemorrhaging uh, not you know, you know, people that after a few months or after a few months operational, they didn't, they didn't like it, didn't enjoy it. Uh, and what was interesting, we've got the right people. And then from that, you've got those right people, the right hard skills, the right, the ability to read a map, navigate, um, get integrated with the crew, but also with that culture set by the pilots of, of that era, the late 90s, early noughties, and that individual um, training officer, you had the right, uh, understand the, the crew understood what the pilots did. We got actively involved in dealing with emergencies in the aircraft, um, practicing them, and sometimes um, carrying them out for real. Um, and there, there, there was a, there's a story. We had uh, our first aircraft in Chilton Air Support Unit for the East Base, that was based at Luton Airport, was an old uh, squirrel. So, Ben, hark your mind back to your first car, for example. Mine was a <laughs> Mini Metro, had been around the clock a few times, was a bit battered, bought for a princely sum of £800. Now, the police haven't got a lot of money, but helicopters are expensive, both second-hand and brand new. So the unit bought a second-hand twin squirrel aircraft, for those who know that aircraft, that elk, um, had to be twin-engine because that's the rule set by the Civil Aviation Authority, and it was converted to a police spec, so camera systems, fit on it, radios, et cetera, et cetera. The history on that squirrel, some would say was a little bit mixed and a little bit gappy. So like buying any car, you look at the MOTs, don't you, and you think that'd be all right. But the MOT quality might be a little bit hit and miss, depending on the, you know, what, it was, what condition the car was in five years previous. <laughs> Definitely. The aircraft did well for us, though, to say. It was reliable. It had its isms. It had its moments uh, in the aircraft where it would have, throw little spanners in the works like any old machine but its last this is this is a this is a true sort of war story as it were one of its last uh, weeks on the unit we bought a new aircraft a brand new aircraft we got the money together to buy a brand new aircraft in i think it must have been about 2002 uh, to replace it it when it was last sorties at night it was um, approaching luton airport and um, unbeknown uh, to the crew in the aircraft and the pilot the it's got one um 
that aircraft like the scroll has got one uh, oil cooler on it servicing both engines and it sounds very technical but basically like any mechanical engine could have oil in it to keep it cool and the first symptoms the pilot saw this oil cooler failing the pump failing uh, other, all he had was engine um, oil temperatures rising that's all he had so on both engines um, getting a little bit hot mm. approaching the airport so he basically put one of the engines down to flight idle so he basically putting it to neutral to use a very simple language running the aircraft on one engine which is fine it's quite safe we can run on one engine no problem at all but of course that poor old oil is now trying to feed now uh, an engine's working a bit harder so that oil temperature the engine started to rise so the end yeah you're still flying towards Luton airport the pilot is going i'm playing i'm moving the engines about so one aircraft engine's being shut you know shut down to idle then the other one put back up to flight to normal power and vice versa but in the end the oil temperatures just yeah were too high so he's got to do now a landing at night and my airpods are going to fail in a minute so we're going to have to probably stop this and go back um come back <laughs> no in problem. but yeah. um it's an emergency landing in a field at night unlit so we got a big light on the aircraft called a night sun couldn't use it because you need both engines to provide enough electrical power to run it when you've got one engine running on flight so they did a, an emergency landing at night into a, dark, a darkened field a running on landing so landing like a plane so landing was coming in on the skids very scary for the crew Success, successfully succeeded it landed safely got out and uh, the aircraft was loaded away on a low loader and sent away to um uh to a new customer <laughs> with a new oil <laughs> cooler <laughs> but it just shows that the crew working there together that could have ended up quite badly that could have ended up badly. Yeah. uh and it was a success i had a successful landing on an aircraft that was failing around yeah so that's a really interesting story and and you mentioned in that in the selection process was about priorities and of course that's a great example that emergency landing is a great example about holding on to the priorities without without panicking of course what what, what do we need to utilize mm. in that situation and one of the big things I'm, I'm thinking if i'm in that situation i i would hugely benefit in the fact that my passenger load are not panicking and not screaming and because that makes it even harder and the fact that you'd work together and you'd practiced stuff beforehand is mass massively beneficial, isn't it? Because it helps us hold on to our emotional reaction in the situation and those in inten intense moments. So uh, ha why do you, so this is a question for you. you. You've obviously worked out how to continue to look at prior your priorities, hold that focus of priorities and deal with all the bits that go on on around you. You know, you're, you're chasing baddies in helicopters or you're chasing baddies in a, in a fast pursuit car or you're dealing with other people just on the street. I mean, how do you hold on to that priority and not get hijacked by the emotions, which is the thing that, that, that effectively leads us to crash, isn't it, in life? Getting drawn into a scenario, don't you? You, you, get, you get the old uh, almost a tunnel approach, a toilet roll sort of view of the world where you're just looking at your individuals. It's, it's, I can't put a, you know, you look, I can't put a, how you do it approach because I think it's just life leads you down that way you know before I joined police aviation in 2001 I was on road policing as or traffic as it was in those days mm. being a pursuit trained driver as a PC as a constable and yeah pursuits are quite because they are um, scary sometimes uh, can be quite benign sometimes you get quite low speed pursuits or pursuits that are on nice big roads like empty motorways at night potentially which the the, the threat harm risk you know related to it are, is lower so I just think it's as an individual, you've got to have the confidence and competence to, as a foundation. It's almost like Maslow's hierarchy of needs, almost. If you train well and train hard and practice well and practice hard, and that could be in real events as well, real life scenarios, um, then ultimately when it gets a little bit hard, let's say, and you have to make a decision that could result in a life or death decision for an individual, not sure your own, but someone else around you. You can set back, almost have that moment where you can step back a little bit and I'm going to step back, but, you know, really you look about and go, right, okay, I've got, I've got to step back. What am I trying to achieve? What's my overarching aim and goal mm. uh, to, uh, to ensure the conclusion of this event? And whether it be on that night with that crew in that aircraft uh, approaching Luton Airport, they're, they're, the most important thing there was aviate. That was a, keep the aircraft flying. The idea was to get to the airport and try and do some sort of emergency landing, probably in a taxiway or something similar, uh, where you've got the support of 
uh, emergency services to make sure everything's okay. The field wasn't the greatest option because you can't see where you're landing. With one little landing light um, and you're trying to approach probably in excess of 50, 60 knots uh, to do a running on landing, you mm. do not mm. know what you're going to hit. Mm. It could be animal, it could be solid, couldn't it? You don't know. But the key thing there was aviate. And you've got navigate. How are you going to, well, we aim for Luton Airport, that's not a problem, but communicate is important. And commun- having that clear line of communication. And you look at in the aviation world, in the police aviation world, crew of three, pilot, the taxi driver, um, just as important as the rear observer in the back, who is a police officer, who is similarly qualified experience as the front seat observer. They have disparate primary roles, but other than flying the aircraft, the two observers, they're interchangeable in some, to some degree. The rear observer would be the aircraft commander, would manage uh, with, in, in the police aircraft then and now. Normally you have four police radios and two air traffic radios in your ear. So you've got to try and work out what's important. You balance the audio to make mm. sure you listen to the, the right frequency, as it were, to use the aviation plants. But as you would do as a pilot in an aircraft, you might have, you, you're talking to primary, like ground, and then you might move to tower or to control as you, as you depart from an aircraft or vice, uh, from an airport rather, or vice versa. And same in the police world, that rear commander will be navigating uh, and deciding, not unanimously, but saying the job that's happening, you know, 20 miles away is more important than our current assignment and we might need to divert. Uh, but then in that decision making, they've got to communicate with the pilot and say, how much fuel have we got? How much, how long can we, can, for, how long more can we commit aviation? Do we need to land to go and take fuel? Mm-hmm. That's an important part of it. And then you'd be factoring in weather, you know, ultimately, if the weather, especially at night, where our weather minimas, where we uh, where we could deploy to, fly to, land at, were quite still quite tight, better than civil aviation, but we had rules, quite rightly so, for safety. Um, we had, in my unit, our pilots were instrument rated. They had instrument flying time, um, so we could, in an emergency we could shoot an ILS and a suitable airfield, but it wouldn't be the norm. And if we did choose to legitimately shoot an ILS because we were in cloud, we'd have to fill out a mandatory occurrence report for the CAA. And we'd have to explain why we obviously departed uh, from our, our base and deployed to a location where we probably knew the weather was on limits. And a decision, you know, that decision making there would be, you know, what is the job about? So if you've got a missing per- high risk missing person that's vulnerable you know, late at night, you know, wandering a large open area, where our weather at that location or our departure point is a bit questionable. Will we go to that? Probably. If the request for service from the local police force was, can you look for a stolen car driving around uh, Luton or Oxford uh, and the weather is minimal, would we go for that? Probably not, because there's no associate harm risk other than recovering property. And that is a the thing that I took forward later on to Rose Policing and managing pursuit management and giving a pursuit culture to my team is you've got to look at what your current face with your current threat harm risk, what what you would readily know as sustained public protection. What's your future risk for that individual, that scenario? Is there a future risk that might be unknown? And can you achieve the goal? I catch the bad guy, find the vulnerable person, find the property. Can you achieve that with all the other factors involved? And you look at that crew in the aircraft, that rear observer, that commander, they, he or she would not just say, we're going to Oxford. It would be a, a conversation. It may be quite a quick conversation, but because you briefed at the beginning of the shift well, i.e. you've covered off the weather as you would do normally, as you would do before you, you, you uh, take off to go to you know, some far-flung part of the world, um, you've briefed an emergency of the day and talked through it, even though you might have briefed the same emergency two weeks earlier. You might have had opportunity to practice that emergency at some stage that day to reinforce what is on the, the flight reference cards and emergency actions. Um, and you might have factors in, you might have a, an, uh, another uh, crew member in the aircraft, you might have a, um, another police employee coming out. For, we had people come out for observational tours for a day to see what police aviation does. There were police staff and police officers. So you've got to factor the fact that they're in the back of the aircraft. So, you know, what if we're flying on minimum levels, are we putting them at harm's way? As a crew, we have that conversation that some jobs merit, you know, giving it all. You know, you look at um, like a firearms incident with, a, with an offender of a live, live firearm at, at large uh, being followed by armed officers. You want to be there. Because ultimately you are a, p- a point of view on the video camera system on the aircraft to see what's going on and support, more importantly, 
how to deploy those officers effectively. Uh, and the front observer um, would be the, the, taking up some of the radio traffic uh, of other conflicting tasks, resources. Bear in mind, my unit would cover uh, three forces and six counties and beyond. There would be arrangements with other forces, particularly the Metropolitan Police, which bordered my area. They, uh, on occasion, would run out of helicopters, bizarrely, even though they had three. We'd, we wouldn't hold that against them. They had three aircraft, but they wouldn't always have enough aircraft for their, their demands. Mm -hmm. Or... Or we'd fly, into, we'd have a pursuit, for example, a dynamic job that would go into their into their manor, as you'd say in police terms, into their area of ops. So we'd have to communicate with them and yeah, and make sure that whether we keep it or whether we'd hand it over to that air, that that other air support unit, a pursuit, for example. They, if you, you know, even though the police in the UK, England, Wales, particularly, is quite joined up, and it, and it was joined up then, there are so many isms about a police service. So each county and each force or, you know, will have its own isms. And also radio structure, it's a bit, this is a bit dull, but uh, there are some issues with the radio, uh, the, the way we can only listen to certain number of radio channels in the UK. So sometimes it's better to have a, the home force helicopter in those days take over from us because they can communicate easier with their control room and their officers. It's not impossible. It just means we've got less buttons to push in the aircraft to try and facilitate that communication effectively. And also local knowledge. Um, if you've ever flown over London, if you've ever had the opportunity, if anybody who is seeing this today's podcast has the opportunity to fly in a helicopter over London and then look down at the busy streets and then go, actually, can I work out what the road name, looking at an ordnance survey map or an A to Z, can I work out what's the road, the name of that road below me or that block of flats, what are they? And do it within 20 seconds, 30 seconds, because a car's just turned into that road. It's quite hard because you've got the, the urban seriously, you know, sprawl. Seriously hard, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it's, it is. Yeah. It's, so it's, getting the right training, you know, looking at that, that is very, very important, and getting that right culture to support that training in the crew and make sure people understand, the pilot would understand our roles and get involved. They'd get involved in, in daytime, Mark, when I board, they'd be looking out the aircraft as much as the air observers. And if we're looking out for a, a bad guy wearing a red jumper and blue jeans, you know, with, with a black rucksack, he'd be, he or she'd be calling out to us, have you seen that person at two o'clock low next to the... Uh, the, the wee bin, that sort of thing. You know, they'd be part and parcel of the same, same sort of, you know, getting involved. And, they, and to be fair, I never met a pilot, even our spare, we had um, pilots who'd cover, you know, sickness or, or leave, that was, that just came in, you know, spare pilots for us. They were always keen. They loved aviation. They loved getting involved in the police force. It's more exciting than flying off the back of a ship, you know, back of a yacht, or <laughs> flying, you know, you know, routinely between A to B. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it tested their skills because, you know, you, you look at, you know, any pilot that flies, they're relying on uh, an air observer, a police officer that's not trained as a pilot to navigate using, you know, using the, you know, either computer mapping or paper mapping to not bust any controlled airspace uh, to get the pilot in the poop, as it were, uh, and to fly safely. So to call out all those hazards, you know, whether it be if you're flying low level at night, uh, right on the minima, you're looking at high tension wires, you know, you're looking, they're, they're key. Um, to keep an eye out and daytime particularly daytime limits meant that there are times we could fly lower than some of the, the pylons you know, that are around us in the UK mm -hmm. and you know when you're flying that sort of low you've got to be, you're quite mindful of, of that and that's something that you know, fixed wing pilots itself wouldn't necessarily experience but rotary is quite common to be in amongst the weeds and, and the sheep and the cattle as it were <laughs> absolutely you're really in the you're really properly in the thick of it aren't you and seriously in the thick of it you know what's really interesting there's loads of good good uh, keywords that we've used there obviously priorities and the whole thing is when i'm thinking about this is that so much detail but you know what is the priority at the end of the day well and then you brought in the whole idea of of threat harm risk and that's really the priority isn't it how do we continuously assess that balance not knowing that the outcome is going to be guaranteed whatever but then the, the other big thing that the other two things that i'm thinking of here is situational awareness which is obviously a big thing in aviation but it's it's being aware self-aware emotional awareness social awareness in everyday life it's really getting your head up off the concrete and looking around understanding what's going on being able to just bring everything in situational awareness and i don't think we have a chance of doing that unless we do go through a training process, go through a simulator process, brief stuff. Mm. How do you do that? On your own with nobody else? Well, not at all. So the other big thing you're talking about here is resources, is that understanding the incredibly incredible value 
of the resources all around us and just making the most of it, making the most of it. And I think it's very easy for us in everyday life to that the whole success in life is I've got to achieve, you know, being Billy Big Bollocks doing this or, you know, being the sports star individually or being the CEO star or I've got to be the one with the biggest Range Rover or something like that. And we break away from each other. We break away from each other. We become isolated. Mm. And then the whole task of life becomes incredibly difficult. Just getting up in the morning, if we isolate, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's about reaching out and using all the resources available. And you have to, in those high intense situations that you're talking about, you can't allow the ego of trying to prove, please perform, et cetera, to, to dominate, we've got to think, actually, we're all in this process together. The priority is all for us to work together in, in a symbiotic, harmonious way, but we don't know what the outcome is going to be, but it's having that faith, the confidence that, it, that the outcome will be the outcome and we'll learn from it. And you also mentioned about the idea of training. And I'm thinking at the same time is that actually if we, even the real life situations, which are scary, if we see them as a training opportunity, a simulator opportunity or scenario based opportunity, you take away the fear that it could all be over and, and life is going to be at the end and we're going to be rejected and all the rest of it and still observe it from that slightly objective point of view thinking this is just a training process. It's not, it, it, it's not the be all or end all. It's a training process. And however difficult the outcome is going to be, we can go back and learn something for the next training event. And I think, yeah, that the process that you've gone, you go through, and this is absolutely brilliant. I can see every link to everyday life. It's brilliant. And it's important to debrief. We debriefed every flight, no matter how benign it was. You know, it might be in a photo task. We took pictures from the aircraft for pre-planned operations, for contingency planning, for sites. Uh, and that could be quite a benign task. You know, you fly to a point. Uh, the rear observer, you know, puts a, secure, a harness on, opens a sliding door, and there's a whole process of safety regarding that because they're by themselves in the back of the aircraft, effectively, with the door open, so you don't want them to fall out, do you? Uh, <laughs> and, and take some pictures, quite a benign task. But, but they'll always be learning from that and sharing that learning. And, and when this goes wrong, police aviation in the noughties, 90s and noughties, uh, I don't know what it's like now with National Police Air Service, I'm assuming they had the same reporting system. They had an informal reporting system both uh, mechanical issues on aircraft, so we shared experience. Now, did you know that our sprocket back box, Dubry Firkin, broke last week? Uh, you might want to check yours, that sort of thing. Or, you know, we had this scenario on a dark and stormy night, and it's anonymous reporting, isn't it? but we knew who it was. doesn't matter, though. doesn't matter. It, it, <laughs> just, just say, no, this happened. This crew member didn't do this, and look what happened. Uh, and don't, you know, we recommend you tighten up if you haven't done so already, tighten up a process in doing this. And of course, MORs for um, CAA is part of that process where, you know, a pilot would go, mm, I broke the rules, mm. I need to fess up. And the important bit for that is you know, there's no repercussions. You're not getting points at saying, Ben, you're cocked up, you're no longer a single pilot for the next six months until you can prove you can do the job. You can go, okay, well, talk us through that. What, what factors, what human factors took part in that decision making that made you go down that route? Uh, and we knew it was going to be a flawed end game um, from that process. And that's why you know, our pilots you know, always reported, you know, for example, approaching an airport using the ILS because we'd flown into cloud deliberately, because we'd flown to a job that merited it. And there is a story. I've never met the characters involved in police aviation. It's the 90s, and it was Sussex Air Support Unit, which had a base then uh, at Shoreham Airport, which is famous for the wrong reasons for an air display going wrong. Yes. But they deployed to, um, I don't know if you remember this scenario, it was a child swept out to sea from a beach. And they, the police aircraft deployed in the first because uh, they were closest to it and they were waiting for SAR, a, SAR, a search and rescue asset, a SAR asset to come from Portland and there was a bit of time delay for them to make the ground. And the police aircraft uh, eyeballed the, the child. They were, they were quite well out, as the story goes, quite well out to sea uh, and they were bobbing along in the sea. But a young child... I think sub 10, if, if the story is right, I remember. And they created a conversation. Twin engine aircraft, we're waiting for another sort of, I think it was the time being talked about was 10 minutes plus for SAR assets to turn up, assess, deploy a winchman, whatever, and do their bit. We've got concerns we're going to watch this child drown, and we can't live with that. Mm. What assets we've got in the aircraft, we've got no winch, we can't, we can't physically do what the SAR asset can do. So the pilot uh, being 
bold. So, well, we'll go skid light on the water, which for rotary terms is like, well, how many, how much risk is there? Look at your threat harm risk there. You could get a swell of a, a wave, a swell of water, collect the aircraft and drag you into the into the drink. You could have a mechanical failure. A, a sink, you're going well out of all your, uh, your it, 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 all your regulations flying that aircraft. If it's in proximity to uh, to the ground, you know, in, in, you know, without any safety, if you lose an engine, how are you going to fly away? But they decided to go skids light, go and pick the child out, open the rear observer, open the door, put his harness on, grab her and put her in the aircraft and then wow. fly to the beach. Wow. So the pilot put an MOR in uh, for that because he'd broken every rule in the sun. And the CAA started doing an investigation with a view of revoking his license. So the chief constable of Sussex then was brave and went to the Daily Mail via the CAA saying, if you stick my pilot on, I'll make sure that the public understand what he did was very brave and he's going to get awarded for it. Mm. And the CAA rolled back from that and start to understand it's late 90s. So still early days for police aviation in the UK. We're still quite new then. Start to understand that actually police aviation is different. No disrespect to your role, but flying A to B on pre-planned IFR routes, whether it be a 737 or a small you know, business jet, Police aviation has an element of risk to it, and so do air ambulances now. Yeah, in the it's UK. completely dynamic at every, um, every and second. Yeah, right? yeah. And we're not saying we're going to break the rule just because we want to break the rule. We're going to break the rule because what does the public expect of that police, that crew, and that police aircraft? Forget the human element. We don't want to see a child in front of us drown. That's the bottom line. No one else wants to see that. When we could do something about it. Mm. Um, but. We want to see, we're thinking at the overarching strategy. What are the media, what are the public going to think? What did I sign up to in the police service? And it was a crew decision to go skids light on the water and pluck the child out. Successful. Done. Mm. Um, but you could see that psyche in there. My trainer for um, my initial air observers course is a guy called Rick Newsom, ex-Navy, uh, one of our old pilots from Air Sport. And um, he trained me. And he was of that right ilk. And he later became, uh, he works in the CIA now uh, as, as one of their their, their the rotary experts. So that's right. That's good. That's poached to gamekeeper, isn't it? Because he understands that police mm. aviation mm. world, that rotary world. Mm. And you need people that sometimes go. Sometimes, you know, there's tough decisions to be made, you know, and you, and I, and I look at now, I look at so like the London air ambulance, for example, you know, they run twin pilot. They're unique in the UK for running twin pilot. And why is that? Well, because they landed in very small spaces. Um, and I don't think they put in many MORs about how, how small some of their spaces are. Um, at, compared to you know, a rural you know, county air ambulance, which has normally got a field or a road they can plant the aircraft onto. So a different set of stresses. But, you know, London Airmen's realised, and probably a conversation with CAA when they got set up, was we need two drivers, two pilots for this one, because it is the risk is up yeah, there. We're landing in an urban, every day we're learning in an urban environment with all those hazards. Uh, and... Interestingly, air ambulances have evolved quite a bit, where the front seat observing air ambulances, air ambulances, and I'm not, this is generally, this is my perception reading and talking to pilots in the, in the air ambulance world. They have a lot, they have tenure for their paramedics in the aircraft, which is a good and bad thing. You expose the paramedics, obviously, to the role for six months, a year, and then they go back to driving ambulances and, and cars. But then you do lose that competence, don't you? You've got new persons coming in, you've got a train. So they realise now, they now employ almost like mini air observers that are medic trained, that are more focus on the aviation side mm. uh, rather than the medical side to support the pilot because air ambulances now have increased vastly in the UK and a lot of the, the infrastructure, the A&E infrastructure is based around and the trauma infrastructure is based around air ambulance provision across the whole UK. Mm. So they yeah. are, they're landing at night, they're flying at night now, aren't they? they're landing at night. So lots of extra hazards for them to work as a crew and obviously they realise having a paramedic in the left hand seat with two months on as an air paramedic in the aircraft uh, maybe wasn't the best I mean in the police aviation world I mean I look back now when I joined Chilton Air Support Unit as a PC uh, I was crewed up and it was rightly or wrongly I joined with, I was a Harpshire officer at the time and I joined with a Bevshire officer who both did the same course and our roster meant that we were crewed quite a lot together now, some would say, is that a good thing? You know, you've got two youngish police officers, different experiences, different backgrounds to get to that role, are new to police aviation, under probation, sort of under a bit of scrutiny as well, to make sure they are safe. You know, is that the right thing to do? And looking back, you know, you, you know I flew with experienced air observers, but they were, they were different, different culture. 
different different individuals. It's quite interesting to see that. You know, when you work with two young, I'm not saying enthusiastic, that's probably, but two young, relatively inexperienced air observers, experienced police officers uh, in a crew. And the pilots, when I later on came a sergeant, and you're having conversations with the pilots who are your common thread in this. You know, what you don't want, really, you could argue, is two brand new police air observers in the aircraft uh, with, a, say, a, we call them loner pilots, spare pilots covering sickness. It's not familiar with the mm. area, doing a night sortie. And we covered over right up to Swindon, you know, and at night. That's quite a long old haul. Uh, and you're looking, you know, again, you're looking at trying the safety of that. And we'd have conversations. Is that right? Is that, is that the right crew mix? to do a set of five night shifts where for at least three of those, we're covering five counties and beyond. Um, and their experience of, you know, alternate landing sites, um, hazards, and working together as a crew and experience with the aircraft. Because as you know, you, if you fly the same aircraft for a long time, you get used to its little isms, little things, especially as they get older. Mm. And mm. you can understand if you get an issue, how to manage that best, and especially the role equipment, you know, how it works best for the crew. So, yeah, you have those, those conversations. Do you bring in, 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 you know, if inexperience is in the mix, even though you might have the best selection process, the best training process, and the best individuals in that, in that crew, you got to be mindful of, uh, of the fact, do you expose them to that level of Risk is probably the wrong phrase, but you know you could. There could be an element where they have to mm. look at mm. something that would potentially bite them in. Mm. I think that's that's the big thing. So you said, is it the right thing to do? And and we, we've talked about that before. We never really know is it the right thing to do. But if we do the the planning process and, and going back to the kind of whole training scenario, the simulator scenario is getting, putting ourselves mm. through that situation so that we become familiar with the scenarios before it happens in real life. And we, more importantly, become familiar with the emotional reaction to it. But again, when it comes to the, yeah. is it the right thing to do? We're actually questioning our, questioning the emotional response if it goes wrong. Because if it goes right, then we're all the bloody heroes, aren't we? And everything, and, and it gets, you know, yeah. the story can be embellished into even greater hero status and look what I've achieved, of course. But the other side of it is much harder to deal with is if it's gone wrong. But having faith that we have to make a decision, we have to take a risk. There are, there is going to be sometimes a, an absolutely, an absolute disastrous outcome. But of course, you talked about debrief. As long as we're honest about it and we just think we're human beings, we're going to screw up and we may get the CAA telling us that we're com complete, you know, we, we did the wrong thing completely, even though the big picture, the priority was to save life at the end of the day human priority and purpose is really to preserve and, and procreate really that's the basic thing so how do we again how do we this is this is another thing we were talking about a little bit earlier how do we deal with those situations when it does go wrong is it the right th thing to do we don't know at the end of it we can either say that was the wrong thing to do or was i see yeah, as soon as we use the right and wrong terms it's, du it's duality it's polarity you you completely you're either the hero or the or or the shit bag, and that's not helpful because we're always learning. We're always learning. Yeah. Everything is a learning opportunity. How do we get it out? And you told me that brilliant story about the scenario when you're in the pursuit, uh, the vehicles, you know, the, the effect of the simulator scenario of when you're chasing somebody who's a murderer and he's mounting the curb and all the way through to the barrister interrogation at the end. And I think that's, that's incredibly important because the chances are, if our decision goes wrong, we're going to be hung up in court or we're going to be hung up with the CA, lose our license, or we're going to be shamed by our community. We're going to be told we're no good. You know, how do we avoid the dark, dark emotional situation of, of feeling as though we're, we're not good enough? And how do we still make those decisions to take it a little bit of a risk? So yeah, talk us, talk us through that scenario with the, with up to the barrister stage of the, of the pursuit thing. Yeah, that was um, part of my, uh, as a pursuit, uh, as a PC on traffic in the 90s, I got trained to manage pursuits as a PC on, on traffic to take part in pursuits. But then the next level up, as it were, in the police service is a tactical advisor. So you're removed from the pursuit. You're normally in, a, in an office or parts of the roadside. You're aware of the pursuit happening or is it gonna, is about to happen. You're trying to plan some contingencies in place. And you do a course called tactical advisors course over, over a few days. Uh, and at the end of that course, there's a scenario given. And you know 
that it's going to be a difficult scenario. And, and in very general terms, the scenario is you're, you're pursuing or your, your colleagues are pursuing a vehicle with a known subject, known individual uh, that is a bad, uh, let's say, wanted for murder, for example. Uh, and you're uh, pursuing them into an urban environment at school kicking out time. So it's busy with pedestrians and little people. The driver behavior of the subject is now getting a little bit high risk. So rather than just driving, you know, could be doing 13 to 30, as we'd all be law abiding, he's now doing 19 to 30 and he's mounting pavements to try and avoid capture and make best progress. My advice is to advise you've got two choices there. Well, you've got, you've got a bit of a mix here. You either terminate the pursuit, you say, I recommend the pursuit is discontinued and that would happen. Uh, or continue because he's, he's wanted for such a bad thing. And also we, we're concerned about what he could do in the future because we need to get him uh, to stop him harming any other people. So the scenario would be either option A or option B. And the outcome would be the same, unfortunately. The outcome in this scenario would be, well, you, option A, you terminate the pursuit. He continues to drive and he continues his stupid driving because he is that obsessed with getting away from the police and law enforcement. He still collides with an individual further down the road and kills him. Um, option B, you continue the pursuit because you want to make sure you get him. You try and put in measures to try and stop the pursuit as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, in the mix, he collides with a pedestrian and kills him. And then the end game of that is you are uh, then parachuted into a coroner's inquest where we invite in on the course a barrister that sits on inquests, that manages inquests. When you get public inquests involving um, coronial ones with the public involved, we get a, a, a jury. He manages that and represents family members uh, against the public body or individual that says, actually, you might be hold to account for this. So he, that barrister uh, would hold you to account and you'd grip the rail, as we say in the police term, like in any court, <laughs> because you'd be mm. questioned about your decision making. And that's the important bit. It's the working out. The outcome, unfortunately, is very tragic and it, uh, in that scenario. And there, there are real scenarios that are happening in policing in the UK every year in pursuits, unfortunately, because sometimes people do get hurt or worse in a, in a police pursuit. But it's the working out. And I took that. That was that my TA course, my tactical advice course was probably 2014. So when I was a sergeant on traffic. And then I came back in 2019 onto roads policing to look after the operations side for beds, cams, hearts, roads policing for a colleague. And I was given the mantra of looking after pursuits. And what I found was quite interesting. I used the experience of police aviation from, you know, from 2001 to 2012. I used my experience as a firearms commander in the control room um, about a deployment of assets uh, and my TA course was very key. And, I, and the issue was we had, we had, um, I was presented with, with my team of Rose Policing Officers for Beds Camp Tartars, under-reporting of pursuits um, because people thought minor ones weren't bother reporting. A bit of risky behaviour versus, you know, the officers were carrying out some activity, which was not questionable from a public perspective, from a professional perspective, why are you doing that? Why are you putting yourself on offer to do that tactic or that manoeuvre or continuing when it exposes you to more risk? And who is the subject in the vehicle? What's the background behind that vehicle and that individual you know, to justify your actions? And what my aim was, my boss said, just get reporting sorted out. I said, well, actually, it's more than reporting. Reporting is part of it. It's practising uh, reporting and getting confidence of people around us about vehicle pursuits. So from my control room background, because I've been, my posting before roads policing was a, as a commander in the control room. So each force is a control room inspector that is basically the boss of that room for various matters, firearms incidents, pursuits being two of them, uh, and commanding those incidents from the control room and you know, making sure that the, the armed resources or the traffic resources are deployed in accordance with the rule book. Uh, and you make the final decision whether, you know, it's continuing or not continuing. Mm. Um, so with that in mind, I, I knew the control rooms, the three control rooms and the forces, the staff were a little bit nervous about pursuits because of some outcomes um, and because of their lack of exposure to them. So one of the things that I drawn in was preemptive pursuits. So we have, a, I won't get detail for this, this program, there was a tactic we started to bring into play on a regular basis, daily, to bring in to, to stop vehicles safely. Um, on our route, on our major routes, on our road, motorways and dual carriageways, which meant that there was no pursuit. The vehicle stopped without a pursuit, even though the subjects, the persons in the vehicle could be carrying five million pounds worth of cocaine in the car. And it was brought and you think those people want to get away, wouldn't you? Or a handgun or it could be a stolen vehicle. Um, and 
having that practice, and then I got involved in giving an input about threat harm risk to the control rooms, all the control room supervisors over three forces over time, got an input from me about uh, threat harm risk, where I encouraged debriefing after pursuits. Obviously, the in-car video from the police vehicles was recorded uh, and uploaded to a, a, a machine where there was peer review. Now, a bit of banter. So if you did inadvertently crash your car and it was on the video, uh, then then uh, and you're going to get some feedback from your colleagues, aren't you? Because if they've got a damaged BMW in the, in, in, in the back car park from a minor accident, then they're going to look at the video and go, why did you do that to cause that? Much? Why did you ram the car? You know that. So you get that peer interaction. A bit, but you know as a peer, if you're giving that interaction, so you're one of my colleagues, Ben, and I say, well, yeah, that was good. How many cakes did you buy, Ben, for that crash? That sort of thing. But I know. In the next month, I'm probably going to buy some cakes, potentially. Yeah. So you get that sort of that peer interaction. Everyone's on the same level as, as a pursuit commander. We had an untrained officer. We had new officers joining Rose Police, and they weren't trained. But they had to get into that culture before they did their, their, traffic, you know, their traffic pursuit course. So you get that scrutiny, internal scrutiny. You get the reporting. So I can look at the pursuits. And there was honest reporting, like MORs. You know? mm. I mm. made this decision. With hindsight, it was a bit wrong, and the outcome... It, it was okay, no one was hurt, but it was a bit wrong. You know, p- things were damaged, basically. But the bottom line is most of the time it was a bit of contact with vehicles. And then we'd look, and then I, if I thought, as the pursuit sort of lead for Bedcam's Hearts, um, if, if I thought it me- measured a conversation, then I'd bring the officers in for a quick debrief, a quick chat on teams, you know, or personally. Let's just talk through this. How could we do it better next time? How could we influence the behavior of that individual driving that car? differently i'm not saying the outcome will be any different because sometimes we can't control that but how can we think about it differently and what did that mean for me as a um, as an output so i was on traffic for three years as inspector for ops uh, it changed massively and then it started rippling out so you've got that pursuit mantra on a small team of those policing officers the control rooms were relaxed the feedback i got from control inspectors they were less risk averse about pursuits. They let them carry on a little bit longer when they, they could, they could because they knew the officers were competent, regularly practiced at pursuits. Were you almost using live pursuits or preemptive action, preemptive pursuits, as it were, um, as a training tool. Um, and it, and it, for me, I left and retired knowing that it was in a good place in my three counties that albeit bad things to happen. And we had in my time there, we had one fatal pursuit with a fatal outcome where the lady killed herself, unfortunately, um, on very benign um, circumstances, which was dragged through the courts right up to Court of Appeal and went right to the you know, tribunals in, 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 in London by the family of the deceased that wouldn't mm. take the fact that she was a victim of her own demise. And the police mm. obviously were part of that, but unfortunately it could have happened anywhere. Mm. So it can happen, even though you have the best structures in place and the best support in place for your bobbies and the sergeants and the tactical advisors and getting those bosses to go, you know what, you did right. Mm. Um, and having that professional atmosphere that when, when people apply for roads policing and pursuits being a part of their role, it's not entirely their role, by a long shot, it's a small chunk of uh, roads policing constables role, is that when officers join, they're not fearful of the pursuits because we may get we, nowadays we get a lot of young officers joining Rose Policing, you know, people with three, four years service because that's the demographic of our officers on local policing. That's their, their length of experience. And they may have had many pursuits, if any pursuits. Um, so a bit of unknown. They're doing a role that they don't necessarily understand. But it's having that culture, that supportive culture that you will make mistakes. You will end mm. up nudging something with your Volvo and all the airbags going off and you think what the hell is that all about you know and you go but mm. these things happen and was you mm. know did did that end result and for me what I wanted was the officers and the staff around me in the control rooms and police officers around Rose Policing be local policing officers that could help us out with pursuit that they understood that there is a right way and a wrong way but sometimes you know the, the grayness of police decision making meant that sometimes you've got to understand what you're doing how you're doing it but the outcome might be poor very unusual to be poor but um, the outcome could be poor and I was pleased for that Um, Mm. I was using that experience from back you know back in 2001 joining an air support unit not thinking that you know nearly you know nearly 20 years later I'd be using that experience of a crew small crew of three people three individuals part of a, a bigger unit but only our air support unit only had um, eight police officers on it, for example, and three pilots. So at each base, so quite a small unit. So an easy, an easy culture to influence 
a small unit, when you get to start bigger demographics, bigger teams, it becomes more difficult. Very much so. But yeah. we, we all know that every individual has a part to play in that because every, you know, if, if you get, get one person that is, whether it be a, an inspector, a sergeant, a PC, a police staff member, a cleaner at an air support unit base, we talked about that previously, didn't we? Mm -hmm. They are key to driving that culture in whatever world you're in, both mm. professional and personal. Mm, mm. No, it's brilliant. It's, uh, honestly, your storytelling is phenomenal. Absolutely phenomenal. You, 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 the whole abstract idea comes out into real life and you know, obviously you're in a, in very much an active way, well, have been in an active career. I understand that, but there's so many things I'm, I'm just jotting them down here because I can't, I can't uh, remember all of them, but we talked about the, 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 the threat harm um risk thing we in a, in our side of things are talking about threat and error management which is a similar thing isn't it what are the what are the central mm -hmm. threats what errors are we likely to make how do we manage that ahead of the time so we have a brief beforehand that you talked talks about is talk about potential scenarios that aren't going to go wrong without going over the top it's like what's the particular one here well there's a mountain or the airplane's got a few problems with it and not just repeating the whole bloody thing at the same time but then when it comes to the to getting things wrong which inevitably is part of it that's how we learn if you look if someone i was talking to someone recently that the who said that the checklists in an aircraft are written in the pen of blood in other words somebody's died because of it and the review goes in how do we resolve this problem the next time and the checklist right here we are is it going to keep us safe and and do things efficiently and, and enjoy, enjoyable. I use that as an acronym, S-E-E. -E. How do we see life? How do we do things safely? How do we enjoy it? And how do we do it efficiently, effectively? So if we have the debrief situation when we are so limited in our, in our belief systems that we're trying to find fault in other people to, in order to avoid our own lack of self-esteem, we start to in, in make people feel belittled and shameful and you know, particularly in your situation where lives are on on the table every single day. Unlike us, we're incredibly safe in, in an airline industry. As you say, we're going from A to B. The chances of anybody getting hurt is so bloody small, whereas it's quite high in yours. But still being prepared to take that risk to, to, to find the very best in human beings and to support humanity in the best way. Mm. We've got to be honest. And if the criticism and... The, and the complaining becomes dominant and the shaming becomes the dominant. We can't be bloody honest. We're going to hide away, shove everything underneath and everything goes wrong. And there's no more important area than I think than policing in that it's, it's everybody, it's every human beings on the, on the street, everybody's safety. This it, it's so intrinsic. Mm. Um, and what was I thinking about is that, yeah, understanding going in with the situation, thinking that, that people are competent. I'm, I've trained as a, as a coach recently. And the whole idea is that you make the assumption, assumption that somebody is competent and that if they do some pr practice, they will come out with a good outcome. I.e. we talk about professionalism, professional environment and the professional environment is to stop thinking about ourselves and our ego and our insecurities and self-consciousness and let them dominate. In other words, point out where someone else has gone wrong. How do we feel, feed this incredible, uncontaminated fuel into the whole environment around us, which, in other words, is talked about culture, very much a, a, a business corporate thing now. How do we feel that feed the fuel of, of, of just potential into people and, and don't, you know, don't try and bring them down when they made mistakes. Of course, we're all bloody human beings. And I think mm -hmm. you saying that you came out with that you left it in a good place is exactly that is that you were geared towards the soft skills comes back <clears throat> to the whole idea about soft skills, which is emotionally based being interested in people being people orientated as opposed to self orientated. And we talk about Maslow thing. Um, this whole idea of self actualization that's at the top of the pyramid is only possible as a byproduct of committing to something much bigger than that. We can't aim for self-actualization because it'll, we'll never hit it. It'll come because we've thought about the people around us and what, what we're trying to do to benefit the wider group, the wider community, spirituality, police force, uh, operationally safe flight 
from here to, to there, whatever it is. It's the same thing. We have to consider much more than just ourselves because then we learn as an individual on the back of it. And it sounds as though you've, you know, one, one I think still one of the few uh, males who've really understood the soft skills, either the female qualities, the feminine qualities. And I think that that's the solution to so much of our problem now. You, you, you guys, I know you're, you're still involved with the police, but Christ, the amount of suicides you must have to go and deal with, you know, and apart from the other destructions happened, we, we've got to find a, a way out of this. And I think responding with understanding the soft skills, the emotional side, which you're very clearly demonstrating in a very masculine way, which I think is great, you know, because the storytelling and, mm. and everything is brilliant. Anyway, that's my take on what, what, what I'm, I'm hearing from you. No, it's interesting, or a, a, a change moment. I became an inspector uh, in 2016, 15, 16, about that time. And then one of my roles is in the control room, so looking after a team uh, in Bedfordshire Police Control Room. And uh, uh, so I had me, I had one supervisor to support me directly in my data activity. Uh, and then I had about 25 staff to look after. The predominance of them were females, just because the way it, people generally work in control room, not so much now, but it tends to be a female um, rather than a bloke, and that was, you know, just demographic. Mm. What I learned, we did 12-hour shifts, and what I learned about that was myself, was that because I had limited immediate support structures, so I had quite a few roles to look after as a boss. So it would be a firearms incident deployment one minute, which is obviously very high threat arm risk, so deploying the troops, speaking to tactical advisors about firearms, speaking to chief superintendents about the job to make sure they understood and that I got their support as they'd be my, they call them gold commanders in, in this uh, but also leading the deployments and supporting the staff uh, in, in, that, in that deployment in my room. So the control, the radio operators who are supporting the firearms officers to make sure we had a successful resolution. And that was daily in Bedfordshire, unfortunately. Uh, and then, of course, you've got pursuits. But that, out of my control side, the people, the officers and staff on the radio, there's only eight at most. But my call handler side, down the end of the room, I'd have up to... 10, 15 members of staff, they're taking 909 calls, taking 101 calls. Now they'll be on web chat and all those sorts of things, the modern stuff of control room and contact. But what I learned at 12 hour shift, I could be so busy. I could be like in a cockpit, eyes in, flying IFR, you know, just focused on what's happening on my screen uh, and maybe interacting with a small portion of my staff, maybe only two or three. Hmm. And I realized very quickly that actually I need to associate with my staff. And the best way I did it, and I got a bit of a name, I like my coffee, so I had a coffee machine on all the time, but I also had a packet of biscuits, packet of knobs, generally chocolate, plain or milk, or <laughs> um, for vegans amongst my team, I'd have Oreos. And I'd spend time in my day amongst all the general hubbub emails, obviously, like any organizer, emails, firearms de de deployments, pursuits, all the wash-ups from that, uh, looking at risky logs, like uh, you might be a missing person, it might be a, a high-risk domestic violence, assault that's coming in, that sort of thing, looking at those and critiquing them and making sure the right resources are going to them, is to put my headset down, get off my chair, and on the way of getting my coffee, getting a packet of biscuits, and then talking to the staff. And mm -hmm. I did that every shift. You know, there'll be exceptions when I couldn't because it's so busy, but every shift. And what I learned from that, you start to know people. So you speak to, you know, I'll call them Ben because you're in front of me. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? You know, you, you, you put your, you, you hold, we're quite quiet at the moment. We have a quick chat. How was your holiday? Because I know about you being to Magaluf for, with the weekend with your mates, that sort of thing. You know, how, how, how's your application for police officer coming on? Because that's a classic sort of way of progressing in the police service. People go into the control room side, do two or three years, get some good evidence, good experience that they could use to be a, potentially be a, potentially a very good police officer. And getting to know those staff was very, very important and being approachable. But then I had, had little isms. My wife, who works in the control room in Hertfordshire as a manager, she says, I don't believe you do this. And one year, as a secret Santa present, I got a little bell. Like you get when you go to a hotel that's quite quiet, you get a little bell ding, ding, you know, on the old mm. uh, reception mm. desk to get the receptionist to come out to you. <laughs> so there were some jobs, uh, incidents that a call handler had to tell me about. So, well, the obvious ones are, I've just taken a call uh, of a missing person that they want to harm themselves uh, and they're in a car. I need to tell you about it now. So I need to tell them. So they come up. Or I need to tell you about a domestic violence incident. Or I need to tell you about that my colleague's taking a, a call uh, there to, that someone's been seen with a gun. So very important. But they'd always have to ping the bell because they get my attention. But also, that would be a bit of fun and banter. And it was always a bit of a laugh and joke with my team that they'd have the bell to ring. Uh, and my, my wife goes, but why did you do that? Because they might feel self-conscious that it's a silly question 
to ask. Mm-hmm. And, I, and I get that because some of my staff are new to the role and would have a lower threshold of decision making because their experience in the control room as a call handler would be lower than a colleague. Mm. And they want to run something past me, you know, just to make sure the inspector is happy of my decision making process. And I say, but I want to make them happy that they can ding that bell for anything, mm. not just the important stuff. Mm. And of course, there might be some appropriate banter, depending on the nature of the job later on, you know, that's appropriate. But invariably, that, that instant that that call handler has only got, say, six months as a call handler that's new and feels they want a bit more support and all their peers on calls and they can't get that peer support, they can still come to the old boy, bald-headed inspector um, in the room uh, and ask what they may deem to be a silly question. And it never is a silly question. And then it should be mm. little. And I learned that quite quickly is that you've got to get the trust and confidence. And we use that. Police use that quite a lot publicly. We need the trust and confidence of our public. Well, actually, as a manager, as a leader, however you want to phrase someone that, that look, has responsibility for people, you've got to have trust and confidence of your staff first before you even look at outside the room. Uh, and if you've got trust and confidence mm. of staff, that bleeds out. Um, and, yeah, I learned from that. And I learned from that from. You know, from the bobbies on, on traffic when I were posted to Rose Policing after that. And it's just having their trust and confidence. Mm. Bizarrely, although I was still an advanced driver, so I still could drive the high performance vehicles at speed to jobs, even though I was the pursuit lead. I was offered to do, yes, the refresher training, like in, like in your world, um, every three years for pursuit management. And when I came along, they're quite difficult. The courses are quite intensive. They're quite staff intensive for the driving school. And I had lots of new staff. And I always said, I'll take one of these courses up to reclassify. But I don't get out of the office very much to get him actively involved in pursuits. So I'd rather have one of my bobbies either get reclassified or a new bobby get Mm. trained than me as a boss. Because I wanted, I didn't want to have a tick. You could argue I'd be wasting a seat in a car for four days on a reclassification course because I don't, I wouldn't really go out in the office to take part in a pursuit. I'd tactically advise it and say, you know, to the control room, you need to consider this, this, and this. But it's because of my experience. So is that an interesting sort of balance there? Of mm. I'd go on a course quite happily, but I always had too few course slots for my officers. I always wanted enough officers to be trained. Because if you don't, then you, the, one of the little flow charts you have for pursuits is, have you got the right trained resources? And if it's answer no, then you start going to a potential world of pain where activity could take place either by people who have run out of ticket uh, and need a requalification or have never been qualified, making decisions based on stuff that could put them under criticism later on. So if they're they're told you can't pursue, that's quite a difficult decision, isn't it? So a Bobby that may have been pursuit trained at one stage is waiting for a course next month, but as time lapse, they're no longer, they can still drive a fast car, but they can't take part in pursuits in Mm -hmm. any capacity. And they get involved, you know, they, they light up a car to stop conventionally, you know, in a town because it's acting a bit suspiciously and it makes off. And then they learn that the, the cars, the drivers wanted for murder. I'm going to use extreme scenarios, wanted for murder. Yeah. That becomes part of the decision making process. And I'm not saying that officer shouldn't continue the pursuit, but it becomes a big factor that they're not qualified at that time to continue the pursuit. Mm. Uh, and the world in the police world, whereas in, the aviation world, back from my days in Chilton Esport, we had the big rule book, the Police Air Ops Manual, like any aviation organisation, got some big books propping up, you know, various book, book, bookcases in various Definitely. offices, Definitely. relation to maintenance, to operations. The same with, same with the police, there's big books. And, and if you start going off piste, uh, you can go in a world of pain. Mm. But if you can justify it, and you've done it for the best intentions. And bear in mind, you talked about risk to life and saving life. Mm. The police have got a positive derogation, they call it a positive derogation, uh, in regards to uh, the Human Rights Act and Article 2, which is saving life and mm. preserving life. Uh, that is our, so when I deployed firearms officers in the control room on a job, so I got information that maybe a car's occupants, that they've got a firearm, which I, I believe to be an active you know, firearm, not a, not a um, imitation I'm deploying my officers. Now, why am I deploying firearms officers there? Well, because those individuals in that car with that handgun, what are their, what do I know about them? Do I know, do I think that they're going to shoot someone else? Well, they're not taking the gun to go to a Christmas party and play with it, are they? Uh, they're going to use the threat at the very least. Are there a threat to my officers if I use, a, say, a, a bobby from local policing at Luton to try and stop the car? Well, yeah, because they want to escape, don't they? So if they're cornered by the officer, 
then they're going to probably point the gun at them, aren't they? Mm. Uh, which is not a good place to be from anybody. And I, and I, I can allude to a story there, if I may, from a days of air support overlapping into the firearms world. Mm. Uh, this is 2002 in Luton, um, where information received by the police that there was a, a gentleman in a car. He was in a bit of a bad place, but he had a hangar. We believed to be viable. And that was, this was the afternoon. Uh, so we got tasked initially to go and search for a, 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 it's a Jaguar, if I remember, remember it, a Jaguar in Luton, a red Jaguar. Well, have you ever, well, when you look out your cockpit window and you approach an airfield, look out the window and go, right, I'm going to pick out, can I pick out a red car? My God, there's a lot of them out there. <laughs> so we declined that task, saying that's not really appropriate for a police aircraft to look around Luton for a red car, because we'll call a lot of red Jaguars. Mm. Believe it or not. So a bit later, though, a, um, a dog handler, so an unarmed officer, a dog handler, picked up the vehicle on the A6 road coming out of Luton. Mm. Had a few cars in between the dog vehicle, the marked police vehicle, and the subject vehicle, the Jaguar. To cut a very long story short, it was dark. We got deployed to it from another job, so we were making hot foot. Now, when you talk about stars aligning, uh, the uh, the vehicle got stopped in a small village. Uh, it got stopped. It got balked by traffic, so the Jaguar got held at a set of uh, giveaway lines. By traffic and there's a few there's a bus full of people a couple of cars and a dog handler and it was um stopped by a pub called the flying horse at clop hill now my pilot was with us as a new pilot to the unit ex-army air corps good man retired now uh and i and i said take me to clop hill take me to the flying horse pub and bill said to me my pilot said it's a good thing i know where that is because i'm living there at the moment <laughs> so that helped out a lot because sort of navigation was quite yeah. easy yeah so your first thing about navigate, avian navigate is tick, because it's a very dynamic instant now. We're just making ground to the fact this car is now held in a line of traffic with public. So you're looking at what this, what's this person's intentions? We don't know. We've got police officers unarmed, three or four cars and a bus away. Uh, and we've got firearms units that are armed making their way to the incident. And uh, the subject got out of the vehicle. He spotted the dog handler. The dog handler got out of his vehicle. What do you think happened next? The subject mm. pointed the gun at the dog handler and mm. pressed the trigger. Mm. Luckily, there's a reactivated firearm and that round didn't discharge. And at that time, two firearms cars turned up. The officers debussed, armed with what we call long barrel in the police, a rifle. And the youngest in service armed policing officer, the newest trained, shot that individual dead. A sad story. He had a family, he had parents that obviously weren't best pleased that their son had died and were trying to make the, you could have done something different. But you look at that scenario and then you take the information that handgun went to the uh, home office firearms testing laboratory uh, and the next round discharged. So the next round was a semi-automatic pistol. So the, 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 the dead round would have been dis- Ejected from the, the shell case had been ejected from the, uh, the pistol. The next round would have been discharged. And you've not only got a, a police officer in the line of fire to use, uh, probably a new comment, but you've now got all the public as well. Mm. So then as a, I mean, I was just an air observer in the aircraft. I was a front seat observer filming it. So I filmed what I believe to be the first live fatal police shooting from a police aircraft in the UK. Bizarrely. Mm. Sad though it was. And that went through inquest uh, and so forth but then I was on a firearms commander's course back in 2017 in North Midlands I was with a bunch of similar inspectors like myself and the trainers were firearms trainers uh, it's a two week course I said oh, gentlemen ladies uh, we're going to show you a video um, I don't know if anybody knows about this video from a helicopter a, a man getting shot and, and one of the firearms uh, instructors looked at me and said um, Richie you're Bedfordshire aren't you do you know anything about this and I went I knew the video went viral as internally within the police yeah, service of course, of course. and I went I might do and it was good it was good context so those instructors because I could give the background they knew a little bit but they knew about a little bit about the handgun that was it they didn't know about the context behind it and the subsequent mm. board investigation inquiry and all that mm. but by the grace of God that dog handler lived to tell the tale yeah, uh, yeah unfortunately priority. the man died because um that's the nature of the beast yeah and the article 2 risk there you know obviously to everyone you know the police officer and the command my equivalent in the control room then in 2002 would have had the same sort of thought process you know my overarching strategy is to, just to preserve the life of that police officer but and importantly all those members of the public and it is also in my best way I can do is to try and save the life of that that individual if he mm been approached by the firearms officers and they managed to put in a, a, a command call saying, you know, armed police, put your, put your gun down, 
you know, and he complied, which is the sensible thing to do when you're fronted with two armed officers, um, it would have been a different story. Mm. Mm. But they're faced with getting out of the car and looking at some an individual that is pointing a handgun at them. Yeah, exactly. Officer. You've got to take Split you've second. got to take some action, haven't you? You've got to take some action. It, it's there's, there's, again, there's so yeah. many things in there. I've written so many things down while, while, while you're telling these incredible stories. Really, um, humanity taking interest in other people, approachability, trust, and confidence. All that stuff that you talked about when you're in with the ding ding in the bell. I mean, humour, humour, massively important. Lightens up. The environment means that actually I'm here and I'm taking interest in you to actually know that they were going to Magaluf in the first place shows that you're thinking outside of yourself. Why? Because it builds confidence in some other people and it builds trust. And what's the result of that? Well, actually, we all bloody benefit. So you, you, you guys benefited in the fact that you had a bit of a laugh and you enjoyed it. You know, it was efficient. It was yeah. safe. I mean, everybody yeah. bloody, everybody benefits, don't they? And it is about thinking about others. If we think about others, there is always something that comes back and it's very easy to be cynical and to say, oh yeah, but I'm always offering people something. I never get anything back. Well, actually probably what you're doing is trying to people please because of your insecurities. You're trying to, you know, blow smoke mm -hmm. up someone else's ass so that they tell you how wonderful you are. And of course, if they don't, because they're distracted or their mum's ill or the children's ill, you don't get it back. So like, well, what if I gave it to you? Why didn't you give it back to me? And that comes back to the whole self-interest is rather than thinking about other people. Mm. But again, having priorities, that big picture, the situational awareness. And then I think if we have a team like that, if we can help build a team like that, then that, for example, that young copper who got out of the car and pulled the trigger would do so in the knowledge that he'd have Baldy there to support him. He'd stand up and voice, mm. you know, voice that, listen, yeah. mate, don't worry about it. We will look after you as opposed to the whole thing we see on mainstream press now, social media is the cancel culture. And I think this is a big, I think this is one of the big subjects we're talking about here is how do we take risk in life? Well, we build a team around us. We will confidence and trust approachability, um, being interested mm -hmm. in each other, all of us benefit. So then when we're hounded in the court by the savage barrister, absolute savage barrister, I have been, mm -hmm. I've stood in a court, well, it was a divorce court, slightly different, stood in a court, being hounded by a barrister, absolutely fascinated mm -hmm. in that barrister's determination to destroy me mentally. It was only part of her job, mm -hmm. but for, I didn't, I just thought, I'm not going to get caught up yes. on this. I'm going to be a fly on the wall watching this. And again, how do we, how do we be on the fly of the wall watching these attacks on us, whether they be justified or not? And I think it's if we reach out mm -hmm. to the people around us and we support each other at the end of the day, I think this is what the, the big thing I'm saying here is that you're very interested in building a, a support network which benefits you and everybody else around us. That's the priority in life. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, trust, support and empower is a phrase I use quite a lot in my later police world, uh, police life. You know, if you can build that trust between you and whoever uh, and you support them and it might be direct, not with direct support. It's just it might be tacit support, just your attitude, your behaviours mm. and you're empowering them to carry out their work, their role. Uh, and and Sometimes we say, sometimes I'd rather someone make a decision and ask for forgiveness if it goes a bit wrong, rather than not make that decision or ask for permission, knowing that they're going to get, well, why are you asking me? You should have enough understanding to make that decision. Take action. And I, I look Take back, action. again, in the control room. Yeah, I look in the control room for a pursuit that happened uh, from the Metropolitan Police. Late at night it was, and we had um, a car running at really high speeds up the M1, followed by a police aircraft. Uh, and the police aircraft was struggling to keep up with it. That's how fast the car was going. So we're talking 130 plus miles an hour for that vehicle. The vehicle, wow. uh, unknown. It was, it was a, a, a grey blob on a thermal imaging camera. So we've got no knowledge of what that car is all about. It comes to Bedfordshire, and I'm the control room manager for that sunny day in, in Bedfordshire on that night. And my traffic resources pick up on it and start to pursue it. Uh, through some towns and villages late at night uh, in Bedfordshire. Again, we don't really know much about the car, but it's making its best to, to evade capture. It's on heli-tele, the police aircraft still with it, so we can downlink, we can see the, the imagery that um, the police officers in the aircraft and the crew in the aircraft can see. We can see their imagery. The vehicle loses control uh, and skids out of control. 
hits a tree. The tree is decapitated at the base. It's quite a big tree. I'm going to put my hands like that. That means nothing on a video screen. But let's say it's quite a big tree. The tree strikes the front off side door, the driver's door, the worst part of the car to hit because there's only one individual in that car and he's driving it. The next thing we see, the car comes to a halt. Traffic guys get out. Now, traffic guys are advanced first aid train, like firearms officers, because we do a lot of, unfortunately, a lot of mayhem on the roads. Mm. Uh, mm. The officer's got the individual out. He's unconscious. They're reporting to us. He is unconscious. He is not breathing. I can't find a pulse. They're starting to do CPR. This is on heli telly. So we've got my staff. And you see the impact on the radio operators, because they know... If this person dies or has life-changing injuries, they're going to be under scrutiny. Mm. But all I said to them is, you've, you've got my back. And we're writing up now how it will happen. Record everything. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't focus on the fact that something bad has happened. Now, fortunately, whether he was really, um, he, he probably was unconscious, probably deep unconscious, and the officers couldn't detect the pulse, and there probably was very limited breathing. But with a bit of chest compressions and he got a sore sternum out of this, he came back to life. You know, so the scrutiny Gosh. came off. There was a little bit of post debrief script. Don't be wrong. It was his. And he was a bad lad. Very, very, very bad lad. And we got him. Um, but it was just seeing those staff members going through that little bit of concern that they get involved in some sort of board inquiry, which would ask. But I said, you've got my support. You've got um, you've got all that uh, structure behind you that. I'm the commander. You're merely making sure by the radio communications that officers and other people know where the pursuit is and managing it accordingly. Uh, and that the, the hindsight guru could have said, discontinue the pursuit. It's too fast. It's too dangerous. We don't know much about the car. Mm. If that had been four o'clock on a Friday afternoon outside of school. Yes, definitely. Mm. But surely the police have got you as a, a member of the public and me as a member of the public. We expect the police to catch bad people, don't we? Mm. Not at exactly. all cost, but uh, uh, we need to catch. I need to get that team ethos to understand that yeah. Yeah, those officers are well trained in the pursuit management. They were well trained in doing the first aid element when they dragged them out of the car. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And again, it comes down to option. priorities. Is we're preserving life. Mm. Okay, sometimes mm. we have to risk life in order to preserve greater life. I mean, you know, you can't, we can't go yeah. into the philosophical debate about whose life is worth preserving but we have to make those instantaneous decisions sometimes we have to we have to take action and it, we have we've got to take risk in a in a world now where we our youngsters this is the big thing i'm i'm concerned about is our youngsters are being told not to take risk they're encouraged not to take risk of course covid came in and it was all about not taking any risk yeah. the whole health and safety and you think well actually we're not going to achieve anything in life we're not going to evolve in life we're not going to be able to deal with any of the hardships in life unless we go through the risk of, of getting things wrong because that's how you build confidence. That's how you build trust. That's how you build resilience, which is a, yeah. a big word. It's grit, isn't it? The old, the old version of, of grit and character mm. is now talked, you know, referred to yeah. as, as in uh, resilience. And at the end of the day, whatever scenario plays out, it is the right scenario. And instead of being hounded in, in the public arena or hounded in a barrister's court in, in a, by a barrister in a court saying you did the wrong thing there is no wrong thing in my mind there is no wrong thing there are only learning opportunities and that sounds a bit uh, glib classic instagram psychologist yeah there are no you know the, you only ever learn but your situation is bloody well <laughs> right in the core of right uh, this is proper experience this is proper life death and life really and i think it's really important um richie we've been going on for i think nearly an hour and a half now or so um so yeah. I, unfortunately i'm going to wrap it up but uh, again i say this to all my guests because they've just been absolutely so fascinated and it can, continues to be and i am absolutely in awe of your storytelling ability and it's not fucking bullshit excuse my language it's real life stuff and anybody listening to this is going to get so much out of this and please to anybody listening to us just it's not just about the big really big, big bo bollocks hero uh, policeman or, or aviator or whatever this is about how we apply this to every single moment of our life how, from the from the moment we wake up mm -hmm. so what i'm going to do this is the first time i've done this on the podcast i've developed this concept called smell and i'm going to ask you i haven't pre-warned you for this because you're a pretty tough son of a bitch and i'm i'm gonna gonna lease this on you it's called what is your smell and the m-e-l-l -L stands for minimum 
equipment list effectively. So in an aeroplane, we have a minimum mm. equipment list, as you well know. You can't take off unless, mm. unless you satisfy the requirements of that um, of the minimum equipment list, which is uh, a requirement, legal requirement. Okay, so I've adapted that. What is my minimum equipment list? On the end of it is another L. Um, so for me, it's music, exercise, laughter, and learning. And the one at the beginning mm -hmm. is an S, which my stepfather with a bit of dementia came up with this, which was brilliant, turned it into smell. It, S stands for shit. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the shit in life is right. a fertilizer, isn't it? So we all think, oh, life's a bit shit. And, mm -hmm. oh, you're a shit and I'm a bit mm -hmm. shit. At the end of the day, if we, if we choose the mindset to think that shit is a fertilizer, then we, we succeed. So anyway, you don't have to come up with a, an S-M-E-L-L, -L, but what would be your minimum equipment list for, for dealing with life and, and the goods and the bads, you know, say you're in the heart of, of difficulties um, emotionally, you know, what do you, what do you do? Is it breathing? Is it exercise? I know that you're a runner. What are your, what are your, give, give me three things that you do just to keep yourself on the straight and narrow in the greens, keeping it in the greens. Keeping it in the greens, minimum equipment list. Yeah, definitely have outside interests, have a good support network. That could be family. That could be in my running groups. It could be uh, work colleagues. Um, yeah, so having an outside interest, running for me is good headspace. Having a support group, family, and uh, and the wider family definition, whatever, however you want to word that, and how you want to describe that. Uh, and, yeah, it'll always get better from your learning. You know, I look at my 30 years in the police service, and when I joined Watford Police in 1993 as a bobby with a top hat and a tunic walking the high street in Watford, for those people <laughs> that may know Watford, yeah. a few years later, there was a, you know, well, it must be 2021, 2020, there was a NATO conference at a posh hotel near Watford, and I drove my marked traffic BMW X5 down to Watford for a couple of meetings um, to talk about the security and the roads policing response to protecting all the presidents and, and, the, and the learned, you know, the prime ministers of the world. Um, and I drove around Watford and I went, this is a big journey, 30 years almost, where I, I wouldn't have thought as a PC walking the town centre of Watford, you know, when all the clubs are kicking out, etc. I wouldn't have thought 28 years later I'd be driving a BMW X5 as a inspector on roads policing um, and how to get to that journey sometimes I manifest that, that I, I apply for jobs I put myself mm. into harm's way by exposing myself to mm. interviews and Taking learning how to, what my risk. skill set was mm. Under, so understanding yourself was important what is your strengths and weaknesses Don't, I, I could never be a detective so I never went for detective roles so there's understanding that and going what you're good at um, and that's the, that's the key thing for me uh, in amongst the fact that sometimes what is bad now, what your shit is now, sometimes will fertilise later on to be a good thing, a positive experience. Yeah, brilliant. I love that. Okay, so community, taking a bit of a risk and understanding yourself, which is everything I agree with. And all, all my all my stuff, shit, is everything leads to the growth of something. The music is can be played is often yeah. played with everyone else. That's part of the community exercise. I play sports, I play cricket, I help coach. That's all part of the community. Um, and laughter, it, yeah, when you're laughing with other people or with the community and you're learning about yourself. And I think that's all the same message, isn't it, at the you end are. of the day? Absolutely brilliant, Richie. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry that we have to, to, to wind this up, but thank you so much for, for coming on. It's been an absolute yeah. pleasure. Likewise, yeah, I've been enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, it's been good. And for everybody watching, um, wish you all the very best and please do remember to keep it in the greens. Mm -hmm.